Mary, Queen of Scots. Three crowns, three husbands and one seriously bodged execution. Her life kinda reads like the lyric to a renaissance country song, if that was a thing. She's had a lot of labels chucked at her over the years, but this is 2021. So what's the real deal? Welcome to Scotland Unplugged, and the story of Scotland's most enigmatic royal. Buckle up, this one gets bumpy. Mary was born in Linlithgow Palace on the 8th of December 1542. I've definitely seen worse maternity wards. Meanwhile, her father, James V, was busy dying in Falkland Palace. He's thought to have been struck down with a fever, although some say it was grief. His army had just been roundly thrashed at the Battle of Solway Moss as part of a very human game of chess James was playing with his uncle, Henry VIII. James had five sons in total, the oldest being James the Earl of Money. But none of those were through marriage, and in those days, legitimacy was everything. Six days after she was born, her father died, and Mary was in line for the throne. Less of a queen, more of a pawn. Obviously, with a baby on the throne, someone had to take charge. And oddly enough, there were quite a few takers. And as always in Scotland, religion came into play. Mary was Catholic by birth, so Cardinal Beaton, the Archbishop of St Andrews, thought he should get to pull the strings. But the Protestant Earl of Arran had more cash, more friends and more influence. Plus he was second in line to the throne, so ultimately he was top banana. Meanwhile, down south, Henry VIII, a man who liked to collect countries almost as much as wives, had another marriage proposal in mind. Why not marry the Queen of Scots off to his son and heir Edward, and thereby unite the crowns of Scotland and England? On the 1st of July 1543, at which point Mary was only six months old, they signed the Treaty of Greenwich. At the age of 10, Mary would move to England and marry Edward. Her upbringing would be overseen by the portly syphilitic alcoholic king. All perfectly above board then. No conflict of interest to see here. But the cardinal had gone rogue. He had other ideas. Scotland had a historical alliance with France, going back to the 13th century and the Wars of Independence. Funnily enough, called the Old Alliance. Added to that, Mary's mother, Mary of Guise, was also French. The Cardinal was keen to rekindle that special relationship and push a pro-Catholic, pro-French agenda. Mad Harry, a man whose favourite things included jousting and feasting, especially on wedding cake, and whose pet peeves included failing marriages, Catholicism and Frenchness, was not amused. Mary was officially crowned on September 9th, 1543 in Stirling Castle. The Scots reneged on the treaty and Henry went ballistic. Over the next few years he instigated a cunning plan to make them change their minds by causing as much destruction and mayhem as possible. It didn't work. Meanwhile, the Earl of Arran conveniently felt a calling back to Catholicism. In exchange for some military assistance and a tiny French dukedom for himself, he married off his queen to the French king's son and heir, Francis. Mary then spent the next 13 years in the French court, learning five languages and various cultural things, becoming cosmopolitan and European, as opposed to eating various cheese things and pastries and becoming fat, which is definitely what I would do. In the meantime, Henry popped his clogs and was succeeded by first his son Edward, remember him? And then his daughter, Mary, known as Bloody Mary, on account of the number of Protestant heads she lopped off. Nothing to do with cocktails. Eventually, Bloody Mary kicked the bucket too. And that's when things got really complicated. The laws of succession now passed the crown to Elizabeth I. Henry's second daughter. But Henry had been on wife number two by the time she was born. Hence the whole ditching Catholicism thing. It was just inconvenient. Having to arrange executions on trumped up charges or wait for someone to die of natural causes. Far better to start your own church. One where you were in charge. One where you made all the rules and divorce was perfectly fine. To the Catholics, divorce was an abomination, meaning wife number two didn't count, and therefore 
Neither did Elizabeth, which in their eyes meant Mary was the rightful queen. Henry II of France, call him French Henry just to avoid any confusion, decided that his son and daughter-in-law were therefore king and queen of England and adjusted their coat of arms accordingly. Francis and Mary were crowned in 1559 when Henry died and they kind of seemed to have complimented each other. Francis was short with a stammer and Mary was 5 foot 11 and had quite a lot to say for herself. They seem to have been happy, but that didn't last. Francis contracted a middle ear infection and then an abscess on the brain and died in what I can only imagine was excruciating pain. Heartbroken at the loss of Francis and presumably the loss of France, Mary headed home. Meanwhile home wasn't the security blanket she might have imagined. Scotland was in the middle of the Protestant Reformation led by John Knox. An angry man with more issues than Vogue magazine, more hang-ups than an abattoir, and the kind of beard game that would give a contemporary barista performance anxiety. Mary wasn't really welcomed with open arms. Scotland had been ruled in her absence by a series of nobles. Knox was annoyed, partly because she refused to ban mass, but also because she allowed the newly founded Church of Scotland money. It's hard to be a rebel when the Queen pays your wages. She then decided it was time to get hitched again and proceeded to marry Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley, her half-cousin and answer to the question, what do you get when you combine inbreeding with nepotism? In fact, the whole cast of this sorry tale, if they were alive today, would probably have a cousin called Billy Bob, who's his own uncle and has gills. Less of a gene pool, more a mucky puddle. Knox and the Protestant nobles were incensed, which seems to have been their standard reaction to everything really. It's a bit like saying this scumbag in a furry coat quite likes to torture smaller animals. It's just what he does. Darnley thought he'd hit the jackpot. He'd marry the Queen, have his son and heir take the Scottish and the English throne and pull all the strings. But he hadn't reckoned on Mary. Eventually, Darnley, who was by all accounts a vain, weak man, demanded to be given the crown matrimonial, giving him equal rights to rule the country. Mary refused. Which is fair enough, really. Presumably sick of being told, here's 20 groats, you go buy yourself something pretty while I'm at work, Darnley started to lose it. He was particularly jealous of David Rizzio, Mary's private secretary, who got more attention and rumour had it more than that, which was awkward as Mary was pregnant with the heir to the throne at the time. On the night of the 9th of March 1566, Mary was having dinner here at Holyrood with Rizzo and her ladies in waiting. Darnley showed up with a group of nobles, accused Mary and Rizzo of adultery, held the Queen at gunpoint and had his crony stab Rizzo 57 times. If you look closely, you can still see his blood stains on the floor. Sources of the time confirmed that the person Rizzo was actually sleeping with was Darnley himself. Talk about a jealous mess. Mary sensibly retreated up the Royal Mile to the castle until she could have her son, who would later become James VI, in safety. Eventually, she took Darnley back and had him declared innocent. But he didn't last long. Ill with either smallpox or syphilis, I'll let you decide. Darnley stayed at Kirk of Field, which is now underneath Edinburgh University's old college somewhere on the night of the 9th of February 1567, while Mary attended a wedding. In the small hours of the 10th of February, Kirkafield was rocked by two distinct blasts, which probably had quite a lot to do with the two kegs of gunpowder underneath Darnley's bedroom. Darnley was found in an orchard nearby, with no marks on his body, but signs of internal injuries and smothering. Such a nice guy, they murdered him twice. John Knox took great pleasure in telling people he'd been strangled, preaching the evils of Mary being both a woman and a Catholic. The blame quickly fell on Lord Bothwell, a man known to have designs on the throne and a bit of a past with Mary. Mary then presided over a seven hour trial and ensured he was found innocent, which didn't do a lot to dampen suspicions. On the 21st of April 1567, Mary travelled to Stirling Castle to see her son James for the last time. 
He was 10 months old. On the way back to Edinburgh, she was abducted, willingly or unwillingly, by Bothwell's men and taken to Dunbar Castle. Mary and Bothwell returned to Edinburgh on the 6th of May and were married shortly afterwards. He'd been divorced from his previous wife for 12 days. Initially, Mary thought the nobles approved of the wedding, but things quickly went wrong. The Catholics didn't approve of the marriage because it didn't count the divorce. The Protestants and the Catholics were incensed that she could marry a man accused of murdering her husband. 26 Scottish lords, known as the Confederate Lords, raised an army against Mary and Bothwell at Carberry Hill, but the battle was a non-event. During negotiations, Mary's army slowly trickled away due to a combination of desertion and presumably common sense. Bothwell was given safe passage from the battlefield and scarpered off with his weasley tail between his legs. Mary was taken back to Edinburgh where braying crowds gathered to denounce her as an adulteress and a murderer. They imprisoned her in a castle on an island in the middle of Loch Leven and between the 20th and the 24th of July she miscarried twins. On the 24th, weakened, she was forced to abdicate in favour of her one-year-old son. The Earl of Murray, her half-brother, was declared regent. But Mary wasn't finished yet. Having persuaded the brother of the castle's owner to help her escape, she raised an army of 6,000 and met the Earl of Murray at the Battle of Langside. Only, she was defeated again. On the 16th of May 1568, Mary crossed the Solway Firth, the place her father had lost his battle all those years before. She was taken into protective custody by the English authorities, and there she would remain for the next 18 and a half years. Meanwhile, Bothwell escaped to Denmark, where he finished up being locked up by a Danish lord who wanted to keep him away from his daughter, and slowly went insane. It didn't really end well for the Earl of Murray either. He went down in history as the first head of government ever to be assassinated by firearm. Karma's a bastard. In England, Mary was a hot potato. A potential heir to the English throne, who repeatedly asked her cousin Elizabeth to name her as next in line to the throne. She was also a potential figurehead for English Catholics, who wanted nothing more than to dispose of Elizabeth and restore the old religion. She was sent to Bolton Abbey, which all sounds very Game of Thrones, and then passed around from castle to castle, while Elizabeth tried to work out what to do with her. There were always rumours of plots, although nothing that could be pinned down, but Elizabeth's spy network was thorough. Led by Francis Walsingham, a man who really doesn't look like he'd be much fun in the pub, they were determined to deal with the problem once and for all. What Walsingham needed was some hardcore entrapment. And eventually, after a lot of digging, he found what he needed in the form of the Babington plot. Anthony Babington was a rich merchant recruited by a Jesuit priest who came up with a plot for an invasion from Spain. It was a plot that would put Mary on the throne and Catholicism firmly back in the driving seat. After 17 years in the clink, she wasn't exactly opposed to the idea. Walsingham had two double agents intercept coded messages from Mary to the conspirators. In October 1586, in Fotheringay Castle, Mary went on trial for treason. She wasn't permitted any kind of defence, or even to see the evidence against her, and inevitably, she was found guilty. She did try and make the point that it couldn't be treason, as she wasn't a subject of the English Crown, but that was never going to wash. Elizabeth signed the death warrant, probably never intending for it to be carried out. Like Mary, a lot of Elizabeth's problems seem to have stemmed from the fact that she was a woman surrounded by a bunch of dudes with pointy beards and cunning plans. They didn't give her the chance to change her mind. On the 8th of February 1587, in front of a crowd of around 300 people, Mary Queen of Scots was put to death. But even then, she was determined to put on a show. In a last act of defiance, she walked into the room wearing black, then had her ladies-in-waiting remove an outer dress to reveal a red one underneath, the symbol of Catholic martyrdom. She joked that she'd never undressed in front of such a crowd, thanked the executioner for ending her troubles, and calmly lay with her head on the block. The executioner swung the axe once and missed, hitting her in the back of the head. 
one source has Mary groaning, sweet Jesus. He swung again and again before finally, on the third attempt, freeing her head from her body, lifting it up for the audience to see and watching it drop to the floor. Nobody realised she'd been wearing a wig all along. After that, her dog ran out from underneath her dress and lay in the space between her head and her body, refusing to move for hours. Mary was given a Protestant burial in Peterborough Cathedral. When Elizabeth died in 1603, Mary's son James took the English throne, resulting in the union of the Scottish and English crowns, which still stands today. He eventually had his mother moved to Westminster Abbey. So who was she really? Hapless pawn? Warrior queen? Narcissist? Martyr? Traitor? Maybe a bit of a jinx? Or maybe a bit of all of those? Maybe just flawed? Or maybe just human.